Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, who is Ova Kai Peterson from Copenhagen Business School. We've been to six different countries uh, with our different workshops, and everywhere we've been looking for somebody who could really tell us what the contested meaning of the global knowledge economy is, and where that idea has come from, and how is it spread around the world. So, luckily, for our last conference, we came to Copenhagen, and here we have Ova Kai Peterson, who not only works on this international history um, from a political economy point of view, but also then looks at institutional reforms and the ways in which those reforms are rethinking the nature of the person, what in Danish is called menskusun. And that's very much what we've been trying to do also in this project, is to span from the very biggest changes happening in the world down to what the effects of that are on the lived experience of, of, of people in the university world. So it's delightful to be able to welcome Ova Kai. He's the Professor of Business and Politics at Copenhagen Business School. He attained his Doctor of Philosophy from Copenhagen Business School too. But don't let that deceive you, because he hasn't been there all the time. Um, he got his uh, bachelor's and matrice from, uh, in philosophy of language from the University of Paris 8. His master's in political science at Aarhus University. And he's also taken a spell at a journalism school. So he's got a whole range of disciplines. He's been visiting professor at Dartmouth College, Stanford and Harvard in the US, at Sydney University in Australia, and Peking University in China. His most recent books are The Competition State in 2011 and The Market State in 2014, and he's co-authored a book on national origins of policy ideas and knowledge regimes in the US, France, Germany, and Denmark. So, there are two very good reasons why we've invited Ova Kai uh, to do the first keynote. One, because he has this range of expertise on the history of uh, these institutional changes around the notion of the knowledge economy. And he situates it particularly in the formation that landed in Denmark, which is called the, the competition state. The other reason for inviting Ova Kai is that when he came to DPU to um, present his work, it was the first lecture that I sat through in Danish and understood completely. So I'm really pleased with the clarity of which, with which he explains ideas, only of course today it'll be in English. So thank you very much, Ova Kai. Thank you very much, Sue both for inviting me, but also for this excellent presentation. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to Copenhagen. I hope you will enjoy these two days of conference at my home city. This is not where I'm born, but this is where I have been living for most of my life. And I can assure you this is a pretty and amazing place. So please don't stay indoors every day moment of the day, please try to explore Copenhagen as well. I am from the Department of Business and Politics. I'm a professor in comparative political economy, and you will immediately feel and understand that. I am a little bit afraid that I'll kick in a very open door by the presentation. I'm not one among you. I am uh, from this department where we deal with comparative research. We compare country cases. We also compare cases over time. And um, I want to beg for your apologies. I am an ethnocentric uh, kind of a researcher. I only deal with Western cases, North America and Europe. I know that's a personal problem, but I have very much assured that my, the next generation of scholars at my department can cover also very great and important parts of the world. 
It is a little bit amazing standing here talking about globalization and internationalization and then only dealing with the Western countries. All my apologies. I'm an old man, I'm a slow learner, so I have decided to stick to what I know about. Uh, my presentation will uh, deal with the universities in, and the role of universities in different country cases in the last 20 or so years. Um, I know that to understand these changes related to internationalization, related to Europeanization, related to globalization, means that you have to understand as well the long history of universities. It's only when you have the background, the historical background cleared, that you can understand and explain actual or present changes. So I beg for your patience once again. I will run you through very briefly the long history of universities in different countries. I'll do so to, un to make you understand how little and how much have been changed in the last 20 or so many years. We tend to emphasize the radicality of present changes. But if you take the long glasses, if you take the long view, present changes are not that quite important, not that quite radical compared to what happened, for example, after Second World War. We are still in a post-war period, so to speak, when we talk about education, when we talk about universities. Two things, then, will always be important for a comparative researcher like me. One is context, the international context, what is happening out there, and how is what is happening changing over time. The second is history. History matters. If I want to explain present changes by context, I also have to understand how these uh, contextual aspects are translated, are formulated, are understood within the frame of history in, in separate country cases. So context to explain, history to understand, both aspects need to be emphasized in this case. And I'll do so because I'll start by presenting the history of universities in modern ages. As you can hear, I do take the long view. Beg for your patience once again. I will assure you I'll finish by addressing the last 20 or so years, and that'll be the bulk part of my presentation. But in my view, there are at least three periods of transformation. Before that, I should... This is an advertisement. <laughs> but it's not only an advertisement, it's also because my presentation will be building on that research project that was published 2014 by John Campbell and myself at, uh, by Princeton, and where we compared four different countries and how different knowledge-producing institutions have changed in these four different countries in the last 30 or 25 years. This is the most comprehensive, the most empirically-oriented studies of that issue where, wherever you are looking. And uh, I'm pleased to, uh, to tell you that uh, some of the results are still standing after three years, two and a half to three years. So, in my view, there is at least three periods of transformation in modern age, from the end of the 19th century until today. The first, of course, is the period of nation building. This is where universities are uh, changing from being religious institutions, uh, secularized, becoming the place where a national elite is trained and educated to man a modern bureaucratic state. This is what we call today the traditional university. The reason for emphasizing that is, of course, that many of our ideas of science Many of our ideas or values about the role of a university 
and about the role of a scholar is based or created in that period. These values, these ideas, these understanding of the right way to have a university is established in that period, and they are still um, framing our discussions. For example, the liberty of research, the liberty of speech, the liberty of choosing your own theories and methodologies, and so on and so on. The concept of science, all that jazz was established in that period. So this is the background for understanding the second change. The second change, in my view, is much more radical, much more important than the first period. That is the welfare period, that is the post-war period, that is from the 1950s to the end of the 1980s. This is the period where the context becomes at least more important than in the nation-building period. This is the period where an international economy is established and a differentiation between an international economy and a national economy is framed by um, the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944 in, the, um, in, in New Hampshire up in the eastern part of United States. This is also through that agreement that national governments were given the sovereignty to manage their own national economy in a much more international setting. This is also where states were building through negotiations and agreement a set of international organizations running the international economy. We tend to forget that the concept and the institutions of an international economy is a post-war phenomenon. Before the First World War, and at least also before the Second World War, there was no real, using a definition from today, international economy. The international economy was driven by private companies, export and import were driven by co private companies, states, bureaucracies did not play a role in that setting. Before the First World War, it was all about state building, nation building, and none of these nations really took efforts to understand the role of the state in an international setting. So the post-war settlement, the post-war period, is a very radical change in very many ways. An international economy based on international organizations and agreements were established. At the same time, the concept of a national economy was introduced. This differentiation between the international and the national was framed in the post-war period a new role for universities. It also created the opportunities to establish a national welfare state. Welfare states were established from the 50s through the 60s in 32 different countries, mostly in the western part of the world. It's not a Nordic invention. It's not a Danish phenomenon. In Nordic countries, we tend to understand the welfare state as part of our history, as part of our innovative capacities, and so on and so on. But 32 states established something called a welfare state at exactly the same time. Why? Because of Bretton Woods, because the American forced you to build welfare states. Welfare states were believed to um, establish peaceful and democratic conditions, both internationally and nationally. No one wanted a third world war. No one wanted a repetition of Auschwitz. Welfare states were believed to be peacemaking institutions. And Americans, together with British, the British, so to some extent, forced welfare states upon different governments, including the Nordic governments. So, this welfare period changed radically the whole understanding of universities. First and foremost, it established what I will call a university system. Before 
this period, there were singular universities. One university in Copenhagen, and that was about it. If you don't include formal parts of Denmark, for example, Cologne or Köln in, in Germany, or Lund or Göteborg in uh, Sweden, then Copenhagen University was, so to speak, the only university in Denmark. It was a very particular university. It is more than 600 years old, I believe, traditionally a religious institution, but be in the uh, nation-building period, it became the place where future national elite was educated. And now, after the Second World War, a whole system of universities were established. There were regional universities established in the northern part of Denmark, in the southern part of Denmark, in several parts of Sjælland, and you can see the same devil, uh, 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 this, uh, in creation of uh, regional universities in West Germany, in France, in Britain, and elsewhere. Also, a kind of functional differentiation between universities were established. Some of these universities were teaching grounds, less research uh, place platforms. Copenhagen University State, a re research-oriented university. Some of the new regional universities, both in Aarhus, Aalborg, and elsewhere, were established mostly as teachings, teaching universities. You can see the same functional differentiation all around the Western world. By that functional differentiation, by establishing a great number of different universities with different functions and roles, a system of university was established. And for me, at least, that is quite important because that is what had been changed from the 19th and forward. Secondly, in that period, we also see um, uh, introduction of new theories. All the theories that is that are policy-oriented, for example, health, education, all theories and all methodologies um, establishing preconditions for manning a growing welfare state with, state with professionals and also uh, welfare institutions with professional practitioners. Thirdly, a concept of science was introduced. It was a different concept of science from the one uh, used during the nation-building period. It was a concept of applied sciences. It was the application of methodologies and theories that came to the forefront, and a concept of cross-disciplinarity was introduced. On top of that, a new kind of epistemology was introduced in the sense that these institutions, these knowledge producing institutions, had as their foremost purpose to identify and define problems and find solutions to societal problems. <coughs> there was not only a radical change in the role of universities, it was also a radical change in the definition of knowledge and the purpose of universities as such. I can go on, um, but the per point here is that from the 50s to the end of the 80s, a whole new understanding of the role of universities and a whole new understanding of knowledge and the role of knowledge in society was established as part of building up national welfare states, as part of integrating national economies in international economy. It was a major historical shift, and it was based mainly on the most inhuman and the most uh, destructive period in human mankind, the period from the beginning of the First World War to the end of the Second World War. Once again, just to emphasize the, re, the, uh, the, uh, the, the role of the context and how much context have influenced the role of universities. Let me stop this definition of the national period by um, trying to identify four types of university systems already existing at the end of the 1980s. 
I'll try to, my, if, uh, to do this typology and use this typology in my understanding of the changes from the 1990s and forward, because you will easily see that history matters in the sense that these four types are heavily influenced by the long history of every single country, but they are also still there after the transformations going on from the 1990s. And they are even put up as a political model and used for creating comparative advantages by government. They all exploit their university systems, try to define them as national models and use these national models to create um, comparative advantages in a globalizing economy. I can spend hours and hours defining the four types. I don't want to do that. I just want to emphasize the two most different. The two most different, in my view, is the US-Germany model and the Nordic model. The laboratory strategy and the policy strategy. The uh, German-US model is one that builds on research, technology-oriented, business-oriented, but where most basic research is funded by state funds, but secondly commercialized by private companies. We tend to understand the US case as the liberal market economic case. That is not so. US is, when it comes to research, when it comes to um, technology development, the most state-oriented of all Western countries. It is the case where defense, military, security is the main funder of basic research. It is also the main case where you see a clear separation of basic research from applied research. At differentiation, you won't be able to find to the same extent in all the three other cases. So this laboratory strategy mainly defines the US and the Germany, and they uh, abuse their research. They use most of their universities for the benefit of private companies, but also for the benefit of the security and defense of their own nation. This, of course, goes more for the US case than the German uh, case, but the German case being the most export-oriented of them all is heavily, heavily oriented towards development and innovation of new technologies and using research laboratory to that extent. Also here, you can see included a kind of very specific epistemology. That is the epistemology of the laboratory. That is a deductive model, experimental model, data ga gathering and theoretical development uh, uh, orientation that you find nowhere else to the same extent. It is a particular definition of knowledge, it's a particular definition of science, and it is becoming more and more dominant around the world at the same time as it is still, still a distinctive aspect to the US-German case. Secondly, and most different from that one, is the Nordic. That is, in the, uh, uh, this is policy-oriented, problem identification and definition, solving societal uh, issues, including research into political processes, being heavily influenced by political demand and by supporting political, including government decision-making processes, by producing the, uh, the particular set of understandings that can be used to ameliorate or enhance the national economy in an international setting. This is also what could be called the welfare strategy, because that kind of understanding of knowledge, that kind of understanding of the role of university is heavily related to the, the period's building of some of the biggest welfare states in the world. Denmark and Sweden today have the biggest, relatively speaking, biggest welfare states in the world. About one million people 
of 3 million uh, in the workforce are working in the public sector. In my country, for example, it is the basic part of the workforce, force, high, most highly educated. And this, <clears throat> this part of the population, this labor market, is only organized around welfare and the deliverance of welfare. There are no security, there are no technology emphasis in this uh, aspect because what is taken for granted, what is understood to be important in the Nordic countries, is not defense, it's not technology, it's not national security, it is welfare and well-being. So, in this sense, this is quite a different role for universities. It's also quite a different, uh, different definition of an epistemology. Knowledge, in these cases, are applied knowledge. It's problem-oriented, solution-oriented, policy-oriented, and so on and so forth. It is a very different understanding of knowledge and a very different definition of science than what we find, found or find in the US-Germany case. On top of that, you can see the French South European. This is a most, the most statist strategy of them all. Um, you see the same uh, development of a university system, for example, in France, from the end of the 60s to 73. Alone, 10 new universities were established in the Paris region, and all of them were oriented towards welfare, new disciplines, and much more open to international students than previously the uh, Grands Écoles, or the university system in, in France. Also here you see a mix of grands écoles and universities. I had my first degree at, at Paris University. It didn't matter anything, because it was a university degree and another degree from a grand école. And when I came back as a young guy from Paris, after been studying down there for five years, my university in Copenhagen told me, this is not worth the paper. It is a French university, it's not a grand école, so please start all over. And I moved to United States and I started all over, had a degree there too, came back to Copenhagen University. This is not worth the paper. This is from University of Pennsylvania. It is in Philadelphia and Philadelphia is the most ugly looking part of the world, so please start all over again. And I started all over again. But the point here is that <clears throat> in France, the more established in university system, very mixed. Grands écoles for the great guys, for those who became the former or the, uh, the future leader of parties, of governments, of regions and private state-owned uh, companies, they went to the Grands écoles. The poor part of the world, or the French, went to the universities and later on became teachers in the first and secondary teaching. So this difference was part of a stated strategy to man a very centralized, concentrated state with the purpose of running a national economy from the state, by the state, in an international setting. The British and the American is the most traditional in the sense that here you still find the importance of the private universities based on the nation and state building period and the concept of knowledge and the concept of, of, um, of science from that period. So, future trends. Now the bulk part. Now what is happening in the last 20 and so many years. Context changed. It changed from the end of the 70s to the 80s. The end of the Bretton Woods system, the OECD, the OECD system, but also the end of the Cold War between two parts of the world economy, the Comic Con Soviet run and the Western OECD run, ended, as you all know, in the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. It was the context and the changes in the international political economy, in geopolitics and in geoeconomics that changed once again and transformed once again the role of universities, including the understanding of knowledge and the 
an understanding and definition of science. All four types of university systems were challenged in that period. The point here is, based on their particular history, they changed in very different ways, and they are still there as both part of their national university systems. It is the concept of uni university system that survives the functional differentiation between different kinds of institutions, important to look at, but still they were all challenged. And they were challenged, in my view, at least on three or four different agendas. I recognize that this research project is dealing with the concept of a knowledge economy. That concept was established in the beginning of the 90s. In my view, it was a very progressive understanding. It was also a progressive vision. Some of the main uh, participants in developing that vision were center-left parties in Europe, also in the United States. It was, for example, New Labour under George Brown and Tony Blair in Britain that used the concept of, uh, of a knowledge economy to develop a, a vision for the future. It was also the Nordic Social Democratic parties that developed their understanding of a knowledge economy. And even Bill Clinton in 1993 started as 42nd president in the United States, emphasizing the role and the vision of a knowledge economy. This was a vision. It was, to some extent, a description, but mostly it was an idea or an ideal. How to construct a knowledge economy. You can see there's a question mark put to that. I want to be a little bit critical, because I don't think, based on the research that I have taken part in, and my colleagues at my research department and collaborators around the world, that this vision is still a dominant vision. The financial crisis from 08 and forward put very many visions to bed, changed in very many ways understandings among politicians of the challenges ahead. And if I think, if I could try to convince you to take a look on the present set of visions among governments, international organizations, and so on and so on, I'm not that sure that knowledge economy is still one of the most important. I think survival is the most important. Stick to what you already established. Try to save the political institutions. Try to stick to a strategy of globalization by having international trade agreements and so on and so on. And in that particular um, understanding, try to stick to small time very um, piecemeal reforms of your national institutions. At least, if I can try to convince you that the concept or the vision of a knowledge economy is not that dominant anymore, and there are, all, there are many other forces out there, not center-left, not left, but center-right, and more to the right, that do define new visions that will become and already have become important both in international organizations and in national governments. It's only to emphasize that the concept of a knowledge economy was mainly a vision. It was a prospect for the future society. It was also an understanding of a new kind of capitalism, new capitalism. It introduced a concept of knowledge as a productive factor, the fifth productive factor. You remember that David Ricardo already in 1776 defined every national economy by four different productive factors, labor, capital, technology, national resources. What happened in the beginning of the 90s was a fifth productive factor was added to the four, and the fifth was knowledge. Also, this introduced concepts like new capitalism. It also introduced knowledge as a new type of capital. On top of that, 
it, used, it introduced the concept of potential, that every national economy and every single individual do have within themselves a potential. And the point of reforming the national economy or the national institution was to mobilize this potential. Already in the slides used by Sue, the concept of mobilization was used twice. This is a very time uh, orient. This is a concept oriented towards this vision of a knowledge economy. Every economy, every individual have hidden within themselves some kind of potential, and the whole point of policy making and reforming is to mobilize that potential. This is what we call employment policies, employability concept. It's also how to mobilize capital, labor force, technology and national resources in a globalized competition. This concept of potential and of mobilization became for center-left parties and for center-left thinkers the new concept in, of equal opportunity. How to mobilize by creating equal opportunities for everybody, also at a societal also at a holistic uh, level, so to speak. So the vision of a knowledge economy was the vision for many, many parties and persons believed to step in as the next grand project after welfare state and welfare uh, building. It was a concept to some degree related to welfare, in other cases separated for welfare. In the Nordic countries, there was a clear definition of the knowledge economy related to further development of welfare, further understanding of welfare as one of the main comparative advantages. There are different national visions. The national vision of a knowledge economy in Sweden was quite different from the national vision of a knowledge economy in England and in Denmark, and in Finland, and in Germany, and so on and so forth. The first place to lose the belief in that vision was the United States. You all know that Bill Clinton ran into several different issues, and in, these, in this fight for his own future, for his own survival, he tended to forget the whole concept of a knowledge economy. It stepped to the background, it stepped to the foreground in the Nordic cases, also in the German cases. On top of that, national visions were starting to define national models. The Nordic model, the German model, German model, the US model, the French model, everybody started to talk about models and to compare the comparative disadvantages and advantages of having a certain national model. This is a very fascinating thing. In this period of globalization, a paradox was established. Economy was opened, economy was starting to compete at a globalized level. At the same time, the whole national level, the whole understanding of a nation with its own cultural tradition, its own history, its own national identity, and so on, was believed to be either a disadvantage or an advantage for a national economy in competition with other national models. It's also in that sense that I and others have introduced the concept of a competition state, how state reform their own cultural tradition, their own national identities, their own national institutions, to enhance the comparative advantage of their history. To understand that there are potentialities out there that can be mobilized, for example, national identity. In Denmark, we are told that we believe in Danes. We trust Danes. I live most of my life outside Denmark. I don't trust a single Dane. They're not trustworthy <laughs> in my city. But when I'm back home here, everybody tells me, you should trust your colleague, you should trust your neighbor, and I'm deceived every day. 
So, but this concept of a national identity, we trust each other, we are coherent, we are homogeneous kind of population, we believe in the same God, we have the same language, we have the same religion and so on and so on. It's becoming, from the state and from governments, a particular project to use in competition with other models. Protestants against Catholics. Christians against Muslims. You get the point. National identity as well as national religions, theologies, are becoming part of this whole story. But my book part, from based on John's and my book, is about the concept of knowledge regime. In that period, of the visions of knowledge economy a number of different regimes were established. This is also something already touched upon by Zhu. This is basically the point that universities lose their monopoly of knowledge production. There are a great number of separate, different institutions and organizations created with the purpose of producing knowledge. And on top of university systems, now I will try to introduce the concept of a knowledge regime. Concept of knowledge regime is all about the interdependency among functional different institutions producing knowledge. Some of them are state funded, most of them are privately funded, some of them are research oriented, basic research, others are doing applied research, and so on and so on. The, the point is, there are quite important national differences in what happened from the end of the 80s through the 90s in uh, the national uh, uh, establishment of knowledge regimes. Knowledge regimes, to my point, to my understanding, is a new phenomenon. It is basically um, based on the fact that universities lose their monopoly of knowledge production. A great number of different institutions and organizations are created. But secondly, that a kind of functional differentiations lead to a kind of interdependencies in these, among these institutions. But mainly, this introduces knowledge production as a part of politics as a part of policy making processes, but also introducing universities probably as one of the new and one of the most important political, political institutions. Knowledge is becoming a political issue. It's becoming something that politicians, bureaucracies, private companies, everybody is using as the fifth productive factor, and they are spending more and more resources on producing knowledge, but they are also spending more and more resources on governing, on having power over, and power to use knowledge. And that is where the knowledge regimes are quite different. You can easily see that the, the um, the ways organizations have been established, the kind of organizations that are dominant in different cases, are quite different. Leading to the conclusion that the power structure over knowledge production is different from case to case. But let me emphasize, from the end of the 80s through the 90s, there was obviously a power struggle going on mainly among states and private uh, funders about who was to define, who was to fund and who was to power the knowledge, who was to use knowledge as a power, uh, as a resource for empowerment in, in politics. You can easily see that in US, private funding is a major part, second, probably equal to state, you can also see that in the United States, the executive, that is the White House, 
is heavily armed, heavily empowered. The two major research units in the world, the two biggest research units in the world, is related to US Congress. It is the uh, US Congress research unit, 3,000 permanently working PhDs, the same amount of PhDs in the Federal Reserve Bank, the two biggest research units in the world. They are within the range, within the frame of the executive power, or also the legislative power. The American government is the government that has spent most of their attention, most of resources to gain power over knowledge in competition with private funders. Also, as you can see, scholarly institutions are now competing with advocacy institutions. Advocacy institutions is what is normally called private think tanks. And the number of private think tanks exploded in both US and in Europe from the end of the 80s as part of this building up of a knowledge regime. Universities are not that important in that setting, at least in France and in Denmark. In US, they are still housing laboratories, they are still housing most of the basic research, for example, in technology institutions and so on and so on. The same goes for Germany. But because of the applied science tradition, because of the welfare period, both France and Denmark and the rest of the Nordic countries do not have that important role for universities in, this, uh, in this, uh, these knowledge regimes. Instead, uh, scholars like myself are manning uh, semi-public, permanent and temporary commissions where scholars are invited by government to advise, to analyze, to conclude and to define new policies. This is a particular model from Germany, as well as in the Nordic countries, you see not, not anything similar in US, and you see less so in France. This tradition for collaboration between um, tripartite agents, for example, labor market organizations with scholars and politicians in commissions and committees is a consensus-oriented, negotiated strategy developed already after the, post, after the Second World War in most of the, of the Nordic uh, countries in the old times called neo-corporativism. It's still there, but now it's mainly about the, the production and the role of knowledge, not the production and the role of negotiations, income policies, labor market policies, and so on and so on. So to be honest, um, for me at least, the establishment of a knowledge regime, and in all four different cases, is heavily influenced by the vision of a knowledge economy. Governments, as well as bureaucrats, as well as private companies and interest organizations, came to believe that knowledge was an important productive factor and organized and spent resources to the fact, establishing knowledge regimes that are still around and still important to understand what is going on in this particular period in world history. But try to just figure how important history is to understand the differences of these knowledge regimes. There is a convergency. Every single of the four cases develops knowledge regimes at the same time. But they do, the, do that heavily influenced by their traditions, by their history, and mainly by their post-war history. What is included there? is not singular universities, it is university systems. And these systems are included in, integrated in knowledge regimes, and also the functional differentiation between universities are, to some extent, radically changed by that integration into knowledge regimes. Let, my f let me finish by um, pointing to how different these knowledge regimes actually are, how they, in US 
as in the post-war period, state and market-oriented in France, statist, technocratic, technocratic in Germany, social and in Denmark, consensus-oriented. They show different roles of state funding, different roles of privately funded research. They also show that there are um, particular case-specific trends to these uh, four different regimes. Um, US proliferation of privately funded research units, concentration and fusion of private organizations, that is laboratory, private companies, may a more integrative collaboration between laboratories and private companies in commercializing technology. You see that in Silicon Valley. You see that everywhere in the United States, where the new technology shifts are funded in the, in, in the beginning by state research funds and easily taken over by private companies commercialized afterwards. State and private is mixed part of the US tradition for a security state. France have been through major ups and downs. Already from the end of the 80s, Prime Minister Chauspin came to understand that the way knowledge was produced in France was a, um, was a disadvantage to France's status in the world, and he tried to use public money to establish a number of privately run and privately managed uh, research units without, with outside, outside universities. Sarkozy uh, later on decided this was the wrong strategy and took all the resources back and established at least two new uh, universities, Uni Université de Toulouse and Université de Paris, both um, with economics at the core in an attempt to, for the first time in French history, to create a professional education of economists. Uh, never been a professional education of economists in France. They have always been trained as uh, public uh, servants, as bureaucrats, and they have always been trained in political science, in management, in the organization, and in e economics, and in law, as a combination of bureaucratic disciplines. For the first time during Sarkozy, university-oriented, or US-oriented uh, economic uh, studies and research were started up in Toulouse and Paris. Thomas Piketty is from the Paris institution, and you can see the heavy, how that have heavily influenced the present discussions about globalization and its negative uh, consequences. So, uh, Denmark, obvious, uh, rising state control over research, both conservative, liberal and social democratic governments have used all their resources to gain power over the new kind of knowledge producing institutions. The same goes for Germany. Germany has been through a particular history with the unification of the two Germanys and it is a fascinating story. Um, I don't think you Maybe you have been dealing with that in your studies. When the two Germanys were unified, there were 12,000 professors in Marxist economy in the East, and there were only one in the West. How to integrate unified departments of economics based on so two very different understanding of science and methodologies? They put up a particular strategy called the Leibniz a creation strategy. They invited American, British, Nordic economists and scholars to evaluate every single department in every single university in both East and West. And surprise, surprise, all the 12,000 went off, disappeared, had no permanent position, only one Marxist economy survived, economist survived, and he was from Bielefeld in the West. Um, uh, in the western part of the new Germany. But that introduced this particular system of accreditation of research capacity, and that is fascinating to look at because that is a continuation of the laboratory strategy. It is also a continuation of a particular understanding of science and methodologies, and based on deduction, 
are based on experiments and so on and so on and so forth. So, that's the wrong one. Spelled wrong. <laughs> Sorry for that. Did I? Okay. Take that away because it's spelled wrong. <laughs> Scientification, it is a ugly sounding word. It is hard to spell right, as you can see. <laughs> but apologies for that. But the, <clears throat> the main point here is that uh, in that process of building up knowledge regimes, in that process of uh, fighting about the power over uh, knowledge, a number of different consequences can easily be uh, seen. First of all, a certain understanding of science of knowledge is becoming dominant across these cases. This is the laboratory understanding of science, deductive, experimental, methodology oriented, based on data collection, and so on and so forth. The laboratory strategy is becoming a part of every four case, and this is what we mean by scientification. If you take the social sciences, if you take the policy-oriented, economics is becoming the dominant uh, social science, is also become the discipline defining what good science is, what good applied knowledge is, and how scholars should take part in policy processes. Secondly, there is a politicization of science. Being part of this knowledge regimes, universities, as well as all other uh, different kinds of knowledge producing organizations, are integrated in a process of producing knowledge for politicians, for bureaucrats, for private companies, for uh, interest organizations. This is here that the traditional definition of secularized, uh, objective, neutral uh, science is challenged, and a new definition of science as being a tool in power struggles um, is introduced. And for me, at least, that combination of scientification and politicization among the two major, major um, consequences of the production of a knowledge regime based on a vision of a knowledge economy. Why so? Because universities obviously lose monopoly. That is, being the only organizations or institutions with the purpose of creating knowledge. Now, every university within, integrated in a knowledge regime, competing with other uh, on producing the applied uh, uh, kind of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge and are competing for not only resources but also for attention and for po uh, political influence, they are slowly, as well as the other institutions producing knowledge, becoming similar to lobby organizations. Lobbying for resources, lobbying for attention, lobbying to create um, to create uh, uh, influence. But the very paradox is, it is through the scientification process, the kind of methodologies and the kind of pro the, kind, the way of producing knowledge that is becoming dominant for every single new kind of a knowledge production institution or organization out there. It is the university kind of knowledge production that coming dominant within private, within semi-public semi uh, institutions. And by that, at least universities still have a monopoly of producing the PhDs that later on can staff and man all these institutions. This is a particular and very important issue in my sense, in my understanding. Universities losing monopoly over research university gaining dominance in producing PhDs. Uh, this, of course, have a heavy influence on the distribution of research resources, on the distribution of 
attention on the way of lobbying political institutions, it also has quite important consequences for universities fighting for attention, fighting for resources, because their main capital today is not research, it is the training and education of high-level qualified PhDs. And that, uh, at least, will be, in my view, one of the very um, uh, strong future trends to, uh, um, to, um, to keep attention uh, to. So, let me finish by, yeah, two seconds. There are, as usual, in this historical uh, process of transformation, among countries and country cases, both convergences and divergences. Context matters in forcing true convergency. History matters in the sense they are saying they're still this is basically the same. Competition beco is becoming an issue. Competition within nations, among different kinds of universities, among different kinds of knowledge-producing institutions, but at the same time, as a paradox, collaboration, alliances to enter into research projects. You're part of an alliance in that sense. You come from different universities. You are integrated into, in, the, in the same research project. And the results of your efforts are distributed among your colleagues and into your departments. So competition at the same time of collaboration. You can see that at the research level. You could also see many different uh, uh, alliances around producing PhD students. And the alliances if is heavily influenced by different strategies, going back to, uh, going back to this one. The Nordic do not collaborate with laboratory institutions. We collaborate with policy institutions. The Americans and the Germans do not collaborate with policy institutions. They collaborate with technology-oriented institutions, and so on. A functional differentiation in alliances and collaboration is based on the historical traditions. Also, all universities, state as well as private, uh, coming looked upon as business units. They are managed by professionals, they are looked upon as in competition based on fusion and alliances, they are all taken as private companies and looked upon from a managerial perspective with the perspective of creating comparative um, advantages for each of this. But still divergences. There's still a Nordic, there's still a German, there's still a French, there's still a British strategy out there. Uh, but the basic point here is, now every government, at least in these four countries, and as far as I can see in very many different countries as well, governments are looking upon their university systems and their knowledge regimes as a national model, and try to influence and try to reform these national models in a comparative advantage perspective, use their national models, their national history to compete at a globalized or European, uh, European level with other national models. And that is why we in, our, in the Nordic countries always define ourselves as a Nordic model and tells everybody else that that Nordic model is so unique that we are the happiest population in the world, most trusting population in the world, and also the most competitive uh, part of the world, we are paradise on earth and um, don't believe because that's a vision, that's a comparative model, that is the way to brand your own national model in competition with the French, the Germans, the British, the Americans, the Chinese and so on and so forth. It is only one and a half year ago that the Chinese government started to define their own country as the Chinese model. So, we are in a new world, new context, but history still matters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.